I'm Rachel. And I'm Jessica. And this is All Things Sensory by Harkla. We are both certified occupational therapy assistants, and together with Harkla, we are on a mission to empower parents, therapists, and educators to help raise confident and strong children of all abilities. On this podcast, we chat about all things sensory, diving into special needs, occupational therapy, parenting, self-care, overall health and wellness, and so much more. We are here to provide raw, honest, and fun strategies, ideas, and information for parents, therapists, and educators, as well as other professionals to implement into daily life. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey everyone, welcome back to All Things Sensory by Harkla. We're so happy you're here. I'm Rachel. And I'm Jessica. And we have a really important topic to talk about today. But first, we have a couple of questions for you. Okay. The first the first question. Are you lost trying to figure out how to make a sensory diet for your child or therapy clients? Do you need a step-by-step guide for learning about sensory preferences? And how they impact the child? Those are the only questions. But if you answered yes. <laughs> if you answered yes, we have a super fun hands-on digital course. And it is actually called the Sensory Diet Digital Course. Yep. And in this course, we dive in how to identify sensory preferences and how to use those preferences to create a personalized sensory diet. Boom. Boom. You can find this course and all of our other courses and our free webinars and all of our freebies on our website at harkla.co, not .com. But they'll also be linked in the show notes. Sure, we'll put them there for you. Yes. Gotta make it easy, right? Gotta make it easy. Okay, so today's topic, what are we talking about today? Well, I think before we talk about what we're talking about today, <laughs> okay. today is a big day for us just from... Not necessarily a business standpoint, but just a podcast standpoint. It's our very first video recording of our podcast. Wow! That's true. So if you're listening to this episode on like Apple or Spotify, Spotify, then you can also head to YouTube and you can watch us talk, which is so fun. Super weird. (laughs) Super weird. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a it's a learning process. We're excited and we hope that bringing you the podcast and video format will be fun. <laughs> will be fun and you get to see our faces and how we actually interact with each other. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, now okay. Jess, why don't you tell them what we're actually going to oh, talk okay. about today. So today we're going to talk about how to get the brain ready to learn And just let you know that it has to do with sensory and sensory activities before you actually try to learn something new. These are actually all strategies that we, most strategies that we use ourselves when we're getting ready for podcasting or shooting video or working at the computer for a few hours. So we actually use these strategies. Yep. And we're going to be a little more specific on how to help your child get ready to learn, whether you're at home doing homeschooling or homework, or Mm -hmm. if you are in the classroom and you want to help your students just be more ready to learn, or if you are a therapist working in the clinic and you want to give your clients some new strategies to use, we're going to get a little bit more specific for our kiddos. Mm Mm-hmm. We also found a bunch of cool research studies and articles that we will link in the show notes as well. So make sure that you check those out if you want to nerd out with us and learn even more behind the scenes. Yep. So we want to talk about the brain a little bit really quick. And your brain is full of neurons. And these are cells that act as messengers, right? So these neurons send messages to other neurons and create reactions, which enable you to do all of the things that you want to do. Talk, walk, write, drive, read, all of the things. But how can we prepare our brain to easily create these new neural pathways? That's the trick. Mm -hmm. For many of us, it generally is pretty natural. 
we use sensory strategies without necessarily thinking about it, which is cool. Drinking coffee. Cheers. Drinking coffee. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Decaf for me. Right. And so when we drink coffee, we're receiving oral and olfactory input, which mm-hmm. for some of us can be calming, but also alerting mm-hmm. to help our brain feel ready. Yep. Chewing gum, which is one of my all-time favorite mm-hmm. strategies, provides oral, olfactory, and proprioceptive input, which is just divine <laughs> for me. Okay. Another one would be tapping our feet or fidgeting, and this provides tactile and proprioceptive input, which can be very calming. I'm a big fidgeter. Mm-hmm. And so, and then also you can see if you're watching, you can see that Rachel and I are both moving in our <laughs> chairs because yep. we have these lovely chairs our that chairs allow spin. us to get some, some of them feedback. rock. Some chairs rock. Mm-hmm. I will rock in my chair sometimes too. So mm-hmm. yeah, even things like going for a walk in the mid-afternoon, you know, if you're eating lunch and then you're just so pooped and you want to go to sleep, taking a walk, you're getting literally almost every type of sensory input when you are outside. Which, I mean, you could even talk about how that affects your digestion as well, but mm-hmm. going for a walk after you eat <laughs> is actually a really great thing for a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> now, for our kids with sensory processing challenges, oftentimes this does not come natural to them. They struggle to understand their bodies, their sensory systems, their position in space, how they feel, that interoception. And they struggle to advocate for their own needs because they don't necessarily know what their needs are because that doesn't come natural to them to identify it. And they will struggle to find these effective strategies to help their bodies and their brains get ready to learn. So that's that's half the problem. They're struggling to find the challenge or they're struggling to be aware of the challenge, but they're also struggling to implement the most effective and appropriate sensory strategy in the moment. I even think about, you know, my kid and how – We've had to teach him what his body needs in certain situations and how to get that, you know, that certain sensory input to help his brain and his body. And the specific one for him is gum. Mm -hmm. He's an oral seeker. And so we've taught him and he has learned that if he is chewing on his fingers or chewing on his shirt, that that is his brain's way of telling him that he needs to chew on something to help focus or feel more regulated. And so then he can go get some gum. Mm -hmm. But it does. It takes some time and consistency and teaching our children about their sensory preferences. Absolutely. And so that's what we have to do. That's why we're all here. That's why we're here. (laughs) Yes. Uh, But even as we're talking about different sensory input, we want to talk more specifically about movement because there's a lot of research out there that shows that movement affects learning in a very positive way. Yes. So we're going to read a couple of quotes that we found from these awesome research articles that stand behind everything that we're saying, which is our favorite. One (laughs) article says motor activity should gain a significant role in preventing metabolic, respiratory, and cardiovascular diseases, as well as in the ability to support, increase, and reactivate the cognitive processes useful for each type of learning. Boom! (laughs) I know, it makes you so happy. I love it! I love it. Another one says that physical activity positively contributes to human growth and development, thus preparing children for the mental and physical challenges of adolescence and emerging adulthood. Okay, one more. One more. There is a huge body of research indicating that physical activity has indeed both psychological and physiological benefits, being associated with better mental health and enhancement of brain function and cognition. And we're going to link all of these research studies in the show notes so that you can check them out if you would like to nerd out with us, (laughs) as Rachel says. (laughs) They were really interesting studies, and it's so great to see these research studies out there proving that sensory and movement helps the brain. Mm -hmm. All right. You know that we love our hands-on strategies, YouTube, if you're listening, if you're watching, maybe we'll demonstrate a few of these. We won't. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Because if you want to see demonstrations for these, you can go to our Instagram 
or some of our other YouTube videos on the Harkla channel or – yeah, those are the main places. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> let's talk about our 10 favorite – we say sensory movement activities, but we also have some not necessarily movement activities, just preparatory sensory activities for enhancing the body and the brain's ability to learn and soak up information. I also think it's important to remember that anytime you're doing a movement activity, that it is sensory. Yes. Because movement is vestibular and proprioceptive input. And that is sensory. Well, honestly, anytime you're doing any activity, it's sensory. Anytime you're just being alive. (laughs) I did actually have someone ask me they wanted to do sensory activities with their baby or their toddler, but they were afraid that they were going to eat them all, eat the activity. And so I had to. Oh, like some like sensory bins? Yeah. So I had to explain that doing sensory activities with your younger child isn't just a sensory bin. It's the entire body and there's eight senses that you can work on and they don't necessarily have to include sensory bins yeah that's good keep that in mind keep that in mind Mm -hmm. we all have a sensory system (gasps) what don't we have a podcast episode on that yeah (laughs) (laughs) we do okay okay here we go (laughs) here's our 10 favorite sensory movement activities okay first one yoga positions and sequences y'all know i do not do yoga but i (laughs) can advocate for yoga and I fake it till I make it. But the goal here with your kiddos is to get the head into different positions. So things like down dog, child's pose. Just, the only moving, I can think of. just even moving between the different positions <gasps> mm-hmm. will get that that head. What's this one? Where your legs are like facing this one. Yes. What Warrior is pose. Oh, warrior. Sun salutation. Yes. So I don't know. When you're doing the yoga poses, the biggest key here is to get the head into different positions. Yes. Okay. Number two is to do animal walks. And animal walks are great to use as a transition. So transitioning from one room to the other, from one activity to the next. And then we also like to incorporate a metronome with animal walks to coordinate the movements with the beats of the metronome, just to add that multi-sensory approach. Number three, Bubble Mountain. I love Bubble Mountain. Trip is really close to being able to he's do almost ready. Bubble Mountain. Now, are you concerned that he's going to drink the soap water the first time? Yeah, you try that's it? why I'm waiting. We practice with just water. Yeah, and he was blowing yep. into it. So yep. yeah, but you know what? Chances are he'll only do it once or twice oh, before absolutely. he realizes not to do it exactly. again. Exactly. <laughs> But bubble mountain in different positions is a fun one. So think like a crawling position, quadruped. Think bird dog where you have your – you're in quad position. Again, I have to visualize it. And you have your right arm extended and your left leg extended while you're blowing the bubbles and then you're switching. If that's too hard, a good modification is to just do – one arm at a time mm-hmm. and then one leg at a time instead mm-hmm. of both arm and leg. Yep. Plank position, laying on your tummy, anything. Really quick, just in case somebody doesn't know what Bubble Mountain is. Yeah. Bubble Mountain is pretty simple. You get a bowl or you can use like an empty milk carton if you want. <gasps> Ooh, that'd be a fun one. Like yeah. a volcano. Yeah, it'd be bubble volcano. Yeah. And you fill it up with water. We usually say like halfway full. And then you squirt some dish soap in. You want to do the water first, then the soap second. And then you grab a straw and you have your child blow through the straw into the soapy water. And you're going to make a lot of bubbles. Mm-hmm. If you are maybe in a classroom and you don't have access to these supplies, then try mouth exercises. So we love moving air back and forth between our cheeks. <laughs> Go to YouTube and watch this so you can see us do this. You're yeah. right. We are going to demo yeah, some of them. I know. Right. I know. You're right. We just can't not. Uh, moving the air between the cheeks, um, pushing the tongue to the roof of the mouth, uh, pushing your tongue into different spots of the mouth. Like if I were to touch on Jessica's cheek here, she'd have to follow with her tongue and touch from the inside of her mouth where my finger touched on her cheek or her lips. So I was mouth even exercises thinking, are fun. Oh, yeah. 
doing that one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Those are good ones. The finger in the mouth. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Maybe not. Not I mean, that's not super sanitary. So, you know, make a a choice. For our homeschool families. fits. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Number four. Jumping jacks and cross crawls. We all know what jumping jacks are. And this is just a great full body coordination movement. Cross crawls are where you're standing and you're almost like your arms are up, like you're flexing your muscles. That's what I always would tell kids. I was like, hey, flex your muscles and hold them there. And then you're going to lift one leg, one bring one knee up and touch it with the opposite elbow and then do the same with the other arm and leg. That's a cross crawl. You'll often see the child like touch their left elbow to their left knee Mm -hmm. instead of going across midline. So that's when putting them in front of a mirror is really helpful so they can see that they're actually crossing midline or putting stickers, like coordinating stickers on their right elbow and their left knee and their left knee. So they have to match those Mm -hmm. and then their left elbow to their right knee. You're also going to see kiddos with poor balance and postural control. They're going to try to bend over Mm -hmm. to touch their elbow to their knee versus lifting one leg up and balancing on one leg. So if you need a modification, you can do hand to knee instead of Mm -hmm. elbow. It's a little bit easier. Yep. But it's a good one to work on that balance. Totally. For sure. And then we like to coordinate these with the metronome, just like the animal walks, to incorporate that multi-sensory component of adding an auditory challenge Mm -hmm. number five this is a super fun one playing catch with the wall tossing and catching a tennis ball or a playground ball or even a balloon um maybe put targets on the wall but you're gonna have the child toss the ball at the targets on the wall or just at the wall and catch it so they're working and even if you're like having them move side to side or twist back and forth if they're facing away from the wall They're going to get a lot of visual input, a lot of vestibular input, some tactile and proprioceptive input. There's a lot of benefits from this one. And guess what? You can coordinate it with the metronome as well. What? (laughs) Coordinate all of these with the metronome. Yes. If you really want to. So that's a fun one. Number six is crawling on the floor. And this is perfect to go along with the animal walks. But you can create tunnels and obstacle courses where the child has to crawl on their hands and their knees. And we really advocate for crawling and we really love it for so many different reasons. But if your child struggles with crawling, this would be a good one to incorporate. Side note. Yeah. Since this episode is coming out after I've had the baby. Okay. Yeah. I had found that my midwife had given me research on like exercise and whatnot for getting the baby into the right position mm-hmm. for delivery. And guess what one of the exercises was? Is it crawling? Yes! Like just straight up crawling? Just crawling. They said crawling is as innate as blinking. Yeah. And it gets the baby be. into the right position. I, I was like, well, I'm going to just do my crawling. And crawl every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Crawl every day. I just thought that was so awesome. I mean, there's a lot out there. I found a lot. I know. For the crawling. I know. It'd be great. But I do want to say crawling at school, if you're in the classroom or you're working with a child in the school, just having the class crawl around their desk or, you know, if you have pods in your classroom, crawling around I don't know, the little pods I'm trying to visualize, crawling up and down the aisles between the desks, just getting on the floor and crawling. You could incorporate some other components to this to make it more exciting, I guess. You don't think crawling is exciting? I mean, it could get boring after a minute. (laughs) Maybe grab like some cotton balls or some pom-poms and have your child blow the cotton balls or pom-poms to targets or along a taped path on the floor while they're crawling. Maybe do partner activities and have like a relay race and they have to carry a bean bag on their back while they're crawling mm-hmm. and then pass it to their teammate and have the teammate crawl to a certain target with the bean bag on their back. Yep. Yep. The bean bags on the back are really helpful Such for a good positioning. One. Yeah. yeah. Okay, number 7, windmills. Love windmills. This is another great vestibular activity. If you don't know what a windmill is, think of like a jumping jack starting position. But you're going to look up to the sky 
and then you're going to reach all the way down and touch your right arm, your right hand to your left toe and look all the way down like between your legs and then go back all the way up to the sky and look up, tip your head back and then switch sides. So what you'll notice with this one for someone who's maybe a little bit more sensitive to the, that vestibular input, they might not want to tip their head all the way back and tip it all the way forward when they're changing that position going from up and down. They might lose their balance, they mm -hmm. might fall over, and they might have some overstimulation afterwards as well because it's a lot of vestibular input. Yeah, so this would be a good one to do just a couple of reps and then do some crawling afterwards and get mm -hmm. some proprioceptive input after all of that vestibular input. And, you know, all of these sensory movement, sensory-based activities that we're talking about, they don't have to be long or drawn out. It can just be a couple of quick minutes mm -hmm. and then your brain and body are ready to go. Yeah. Okay, number eight. Stop, walk, wiggle, sit is a fun little auditory movement game. So you have your four commands and you teach them to the child what each one means. Stop means stop, walk means walk, wiggle is wiggle, and sit is sit. So make sure you have a place to sit, even if it's on the ground. And you give them a command and they have to do that until you give them a different command. But then... And then... <laughs> Then you change it and you give them the commands that stop is walk, walk is stop, wiggle is sit, and sit is wiggle. So you're switching Ooh. those. And you have to give them those auditory instructions. So when I say walk, they're going to stop. When I say sit, they're going to wiggle. So a lot of auditory working memory going on there. Even just any activity like Simon Says, where they're following those auditory instructions, is really great to get the brain and body working together. Mm -hmm. Number nine, peanut rocking. Mm -hmm. If you've been hanging out with us for a while, then you know that peanut rocking is one of our favorite functional activities for helping to integrate the Moro reflex. And what we love about peanut rocking is it's a lot of vestibular input, a lot of core strengthening, a lot of coordination, a lot of neck stability as well. There's a lot going on with peanut rocking. Yep, so you're gonna have your child sit on the floor and they're gonna bring their knees up to their chest and wrap their arms around their legs so they're just in this curled up position and kind of tuck their chin to their chest. And Think then they're like crack the egg on yeah, the trampoline. Exactly that, that position. position. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to slowly, as slowly as possible, lay all the way back on the floor, keeping that flexed tight position and then come all the way back up. Now, if you have a kiddo with decreased core strength or an unintegrated moral reflex, you're going to see some challenges with this. So you can help them by providing support and tactile cues and assistance to help keep them in that flexed position. But yeah, peanut the, rocking yeah, is great. The goal with that one is that it's a fluid movement like back and forth and back and forth. And so you can really see those weaknesses unfold when you're doing this activity if they rock back and maybe they can't hold their neck up or maybe they can't rock back forward so they're up on their bum again so you can really see those those challenges all right number 10 is not necessarily a movement-based activity but it's very sensory and it's too it's very sensory, it's very sensory yeah. to use sour spray or sour candy or a food snack item that has a lot of a flavor and these are great to just help wake up the mouth but when you do that you're also just gonna wake up the rest of your body and your brain because everything just gets stimulated and it's like oh there I am God, my cheeks are like watering and sore <laughs> just thinking <about> it. <laughs> I love all the things that are sour too so Ugh. if your kiddo doesn't particularly like these strong flavored food items start out really small maybe they just lick it mm -hmm. and they get a little bit at a time yeah. I do have a good story about a kiddo who didn't like sour spray. And the first time we did sour spray, he spit on the ground <gasps> to try to get it out. Uh, he did not like it, but it was so good for him. And so we just continued and consistently tried the sour spray. We would put a little bit on his finger and he would just lick a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. And he did get to a point where he actually liked the sour spray and he used it as a tool to help him self-regulate. I think that's so important to remember that these kiddos who 
don't like a sensory strategy at first, it's not necessarily that they don't like it. I think a lot of it stems from their body and their brain don't know how to modulate the input. Mm -hmm. And so if we tell them, oh, you don't like it, we don't have to do it ever again, then how is their body, their brain, how are they going to learn to modulate that non-preferred, that challenging input? Yeah, you could be doing a disservice for sure. So I mean, use your best judgment, obviously. There are certain times where certain kids truly may not benefit from Mm -hmm. a certain sensory activity, but if it's just because, if it's just because, but if it's because their body is struggling to modulate the input, we do recommend consistency with that activity and finding new ways to incorporate it. We actually have a podcast episode on the Just Right Challenge. You took the words out of my mouth. I was just going to say that. (laughs) That uh, we talk about this specifically, so you could check that episode out to learn more, but There are 10 favorite sensory activities to help the brain get ready to learn. Boom. So many fun things. Try them out. But wait, when? When do you try these activities? When do you do these activities? Well, again, use your best judgment. (laughs) But I would say before you're going to do a learning activity during transitions, um, I would say before a non-preferred activity, I would say when you're starting class, when you're starting a new activity. I would even say at the beginning of the day, just to get your brain and body ready to face the day. (laughs) Right? Wake up. I need some sour spray. Hey, you never know. Beginning of the day after lunch is a good one when you're kind of in that lull and your body needs some help digesting after school is a perfect time to use these activities as well. I know you're not necessarily learning, you're not like prepping for a learning activity after school, but how many of our kiddos hold it together all day at school and then come home and like melt down, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So having these opportunities for sensory activities after school would be helpful, before dinner, before bed. I mean, we don't recommend any of the vestibular-based activities before bedtime but maybe some of the animal walks animal bed. walks crawling stop walk wiggle sit maybe that one gets super silly sometimes though so use your best judgment use based your on judgment your, based on your child's sensory preferences after you've <laughs> listened to our just right challenge episode yes okay all right let's wrap it up wrap it up we've got links in the show notes for you we've got articles in the show notes we also have uh, what else do we have? We have the link to our sensory diet course, our digital course. We've got podcast episodes linked there. We've got it all. Check it out. If you enjoyed this episode, share it on social media with your friends and family and tag us at all things sensory podcast. So we can see that you're listening and head to iTunes and leave us a review. Those reviews are fantastic in helping us reach more people and find new I don't know, friends. New friends. New friends, yeah. (laughs) And if you're watching this video on YouTube, give it a thumbs up, subscribe. Comment. And let us know (laughs) your thoughts. I don't know. YouTube's so new. I don't know. I don't know. That's it, though. Okay, thank you for being here. We'll see you. Well, maybe see you. Maybe we'll see you and talk to you next week. Okay, bye. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to All Things Sensory by Harkla. If you want more information on anything mentioned in the show, head over to harkla.co slash podcast to get the show notes. If you have any follow-up questions, the best place to ask those is in the comments on the show notes or message us on our Instagram account, which is at harkla underscore family or at all things sensory podcast. If you just search harkla, you'll find us there. Like we mentioned before, our podcast listeners get 10% off their first order at Harkla. Whether it's for one of our digital courses or one of our sensory swings, the discount code SENSORY will get you 10% off. That's S-E-N-S-O-R-Y. Head to harkla.co slash sensory to use that discount code right now. We are so excited to work together to help create confident kids all over the world. While we make every effort to share correct information, we're still learning. We will double check all of our facts, but realize that medicine is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or therapist may have a different way of doing things from another. 
We are simply presenting our views and opinions on how to address common sensory challenges, health-related difficulties, and what we have found to be beneficial that will be as evidence-based as possible. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or your child. Consult your child's pediatrician or therapist for any medical issues that he or she may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast. Thanks so much for listening.